Hello, I'm Mark Pinto, Adult Services Director at Phoenixville Public Library with another Library Book Bite. A reading from the first chapter of a recently published book of popular fiction or nonfiction, newly available in electronic format from the Chester County Library System's Overdrive service. Today's featured title is The Lincoln Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill America's 16th President and Why It Failed by Brad Meltzer and Josh Minch, published by Flatiron Books and available in Kindle, Overdrive Read, and EPUB ebook formats, and Overdrive Listen and MP3 e-audiobook formats at chester.overdrive.com or on the Libby app. The best-selling authors of The First Conspiracy, which covers the secret plot against George Washington, now turn their attention to a little-known but true story about a failed assassination attempt on President Lincoln. Everyone knows the story of Abraham Lincoln's assassin assassination in 1865, but few are aware of the original conspiracy to kill him four years earlier in 1861, literally on his way to Washington, D.C. for his first inauguration. The conspirators were part of a pro-Southern secret society that didn't want an anti-slavery president in the White House. They planned an elaborate scheme to assassinate the brand new president in Baltimore as Lincoln's inauguration train passed through en route to the Capitol. The plot was investigated by famed detective Alan Pinkerton, who infiltrated the group with undercover agents, including one of the first female private detectives in America. Had the assassination succeeded, there would have been no Lincoln presidency, and the course of the Civil War and American history would have forever been altered. Prologue, Cecil County, Maryland, February 23, 1861. There's a secret on this train. In the northeastern corner of Maryland, roughly 10 miles south of the Pennsylvania state line, and five miles west of Delaware, it travels through the darkness. The land here is mostly rural, a mix of flat farmland and rolling hills. It's after midnight, and the cold night air is silent except for the sound of the engine and wheels. By outward appearance, there's nothing unusual about this train. A steam engine, tender, cargo car, and several passenger cars moving swiftly along the rails. Inside, there's also nothing out of the ordinary. The passenger cars are dotted with travelers, most with closed eyes. In the rear sleeper car, a handful of passengers occupy the berths on either side of the aisle. By appearances, they're also relatively typical. Two middle-aged businessmen, a young woman, and her invalid brother. Yet much about this seemingly ordinary train is not as it seems. Before its departure from Philadelphia a few hours earlier, the railroad's staff received special instructions to delay the train's journey until a mysterious package could be delivered to it, transported aboard under strict secrecy. The package remains tightly sealed, supposedly containing government documents of urgent importance. In fact, the box contains something else entirely. None of the train's staff knows this, only one passenger on the train is aware of the package's true contents. In the sleeper car, the two middle-aged businessmen sitting on different berths are not who they'd claimed to be when they handed tickets to the conductor. The names written on their tickets are not real. One of the men, with wide girth and thick whiskers, carries hidden underneath his coat two loaded pistols, a loaded revolver, and two sharpened bowie knives. The other businessman, who is short and well-built with a close-shaven beard and piercing eyes, silently gazes around the interior of the car, studying every person and movement carefully. Every several minutes, he stands up and walks to the rear platform, where he stares intently into the passing darkness like he's searching for a secret signal. Across the aisle, in the sleeper car from the businessman, the young woman is also not who she seems. The name on her ticket is actually her code name. She must conceal her true identity under all circumstances, 
for she's an undercover agent aboard this train as part of a secret mission. Yet the most unusual passenger is the young woman's invalid brother with whom she boarded in Philadelphia. When he first entered the passenger car and she guided him to his seat, he pulled the brim of his low felt hat down over his face so that no one could see it. He wore a loose overcoat over his shoulders, concealing his clothes and torso. Now he lies behind a curtain in one of the sleeper berths, hidden from view. Because of his unusual height, he cannot stretch out his legs, so he keeps them bent. This man is not, in fact, an invalid, nor is he the young woman's brother. His low felt hat and overcoat are simply a disguise so that no one on the train will recognize him. The engineer, conductor, staff, and other passengers have no idea he's aboard. But there he is, hiding in their midst. His real name? Abraham Lincoln, President-elect of the United States. In only nine days, a crowd of tens of thousands will gather in the nation's capital, preparing to witness Lincoln's first inauguration as president. When he's up on that platform, his every word and gesture will be observed and recorded by reporters for newspapers from every city in the country. He enters the office at a time of great peril, with a growing threat of war that could destroy the nation. Not since the founding of these United States has an incoming president been so deeply scrutinized or faced with such momentous pressure. The world is tracking his every move. Tonight, however, he is vulnerable and nearly alone. Tonight, his life is in danger. And tonight, the president-elect is the target of a sinister plot calling for his murder. This scheme, hatched by conspirators in secret rooms and underground saloons in the city of Baltimore, will try something never before attempted in the history of the country at the time. The assassination of the man elected President of the United States. If successful, they will accomplish something never accomplished since, the murder of an incoming president before taking office. This is the story of an early conspiracy to kill Abraham Lincoln before he served a single day as president and on the eve of the terrible war that would define his place in history. It is a story that is not well known by most people today. Even now, some aspects of the scheme remain mysterious. Yet this story and its strange plot and its motives and conception provides a gripping window into the most seismic events of the day at a moment of great national turmoil. It's the story of a new leader thrust from near obscurity into a position that will bring the most crushing responsibilities in our his history. It's the story of a moral crisis in America so profound our nation was almost destroyed by it, and its aftermath is still being grappled with today. On this dark night, on this dark train, more than just the life and future of a president is at risk. This is about the destiny of a country. Forget the fate of Abraham Lincoln. This is about the fates of four million enslaved men, women, and children now held in bondage, and whose best hope for liberty may be aboard this train. From this moment, just after midnight, as the steam engine and passenger cars move through the darkness, the plot to kill President-elect Abraham Lincoln is set to trigger within a matter of hours. The nation's future is at stake. Part 1. The Rail Splitter. Chapter 1. Spencer County, Indiana. January 20, 1828. Young Abraham Lincoln is freezing. In an isolated rural region near Little Pigeon Creek in Spencer County, Indiana, he's outside, laboring in the cold. Although only 18 years old, he's already over 6 foot 2, and despite this unusual height, he weighs only about 160 pounds, stretched thin and wiry on a tall frame. His long arms are skinny but strong. His calloused hands wield tools with assurance, including a long swinging axe. On this winter day, he probably wears a rough buckskin coat over his threadbare clothes and a hat of raccoon fur over his coarse black hair. The trees surrounding this clearing are mostly without leaves, and the ground is hard from frost. 
Today he works near a smokehouse, a small windowless wooden structure, typically about eight square feet, with a conical roof and fire pit inside. Given the season, he's probably chopping wood from nearby trees and pulling the logs inside to tend the fire. Perhaps he's also hauling salt-cured slabs of meat into the smokehouse, hanging them on hooks or rafters inside, where dry heat from the fire will preserve them during the winter months. As he works, a small group approaches, bearing solemn expressions. When they near the smokehouse, one of them calls out his name. Abe. Young Abe opens the smokehouse door to see the group. This morning, Abe's sister, Sarah, two years older than he, has been in labor with her first child. The group approaching are members of her husband's family. Perhaps they're here to bring him good news about her labor. Was his first niece or nephew just born? Instead, the group brings something far more somber. The labor went awry. The nearest doctor was many miles away, not arriving in time to help. The baby was stillborn. Not only that, the young mother, Abe's sister, is dead. Nine years earlier, when Abe was nine, his mother had died suddenly after contracting a disease. Since then, Sarah, his only sibling, helped raise him. Not long after the death of Abe and Sarah's mother, their father traveled alone from their home in Indiana to his original home state of Kentucky to find a new wife. To make this trip, he left Abe and his sister, then roughly ten and twelve, alone in their isolated frontier cabin for many weeks to feed, clothe, and otherwise fend for themselves. When their father finally returned with a woman by his side, the new wife was alarmed to see two lice-filled and nearly starving children who were, quote, wild, ragged, and dirty, unquote. It was only after she bathed and cleaned them that they, quote, looked more human, unquote. The hardships that Abraham and his sister endured together created a deep bond between them. A relative would later recall that Abe, quote, dearly loved his sister, she having been his only companion after the death of his mother, unquote. Together, as brother and sister, they had navigated an often brutal childhood, living in near poverty. They were close companions and were a great deal alike, a family friend described, and Sarah was a kind tender and good-natured young woman. Now she is gone, too. For the second time in his life, he has lost the person he loves most. His brother-in-law, one of those in the group who delivered the news, remembered the moment. Abraham, quote, sat down on a log and hid his face in his hands while the tears rolled down through his long bony fingers, unquote. Another relative described the loss as a, quote, great grief which affected Abe throughout his life, unquote, and also added, quote, from then on he was alone in the world, you might say, unquote. The relatives who had just shared the news don't know how to respond to the young man sobbing before them. After a moment, quote, those present turned away in pity and left him to his grief, unquote. Few who witnessed the mournful scene that day would likely imagine that this tall, gawky, grief-stricken country boy, wearing tattered clothes and laboring outside in a, an obscure corner of the Indiana frontier near Kentucky, would ever rise above his humble station in life. Certainly none could envision that this young man possessed qualities of mind and spirit that would one day lift him to the most exalted positions of leadership and responsibility in the land and that would link his personal destiny to the fate of the nation. Yet, however exceptional Lincoln's rise will be, and whatever joys and triumphs he'll experience, he'll never be free from the pattern of tragedy and grief that shaped his boyhood. Indeed, his adult life will be characterized by shocks of violence and suffering even greater than those of his youth, including the loss of his own children. It's as if he's haunted by tragedy upon tragedy, from which he'll never truly escape. For Abraham Lincoln, the specter of death is always near. 
You can read or listen to more of this title at chester.overdrive.com or on the Libby app. That's today's Library Book Bite. I'm Mark Pinto. Thanks for listening and for supporting Phoenixville Public Library.